Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in this world. This is a special stream today, a special interview conversation with a guy named, named Lloyd Evans. For some of you out there, that is a name that you know. He's got a very big channel called Lloyd Evans, obviously. He's an ex-Jehovah's Witness. He has graciously um, agreed to have a conversation, discussion. Just to be very clear and upfront, this is a discussion, a conversation. This is not an attack time. This is a back and forth where two people are just going to have a normal conversation. And so I'm so thankful for this opportunity to have him here. And if there's anybody from his channel or people who know him out there, welcome here. Glad you're here. Please like this video as you're watching it. Please, uh, be gracious and respectful in any comments that you will leave in the live chat or the comments after. And if you're new here, please subscribe as well. So without any longer delay in here, I'm going to bring up Lloyd and uh, welcome him to uh, Marie in Perspective. Lloyd, how you doing? I'm doing very well. I loved the pictures in the intro. I like the picture of the cats. And I also <laughs> I like the picture. one of my cats in the background trying to play with me right now. I'm like, calm down, just keep it silly. So they're your cats. They are my cats. Yes, I have two cats. Um, the white one, if you can tell, black and white. The white one, his name is Monkey, which he's now. Oh, I had a cat called down. Monkey he once. He was sleeping, and now he's awake. And I'm like, just, just, it's okay, it's okay. And then the other one, the orange one, he, his name is Beanie. Uh, and the reason I'm American, of course, and but I live in Canada. And uh, my wife likes to make toques all the of time. Of course, so, yes. So we named him Beanie uh, after that. So, just to remind Canadians what they should call their that's right <laughs> their beanies. <laughs> Are you a cat guy yourself? Do you like cats? Um, I, I I'm an animal lover. I, yeah. I I have to be honest. I prefer dogs. Okay. But, um, I've I have owned cats, and yeah. uh, I think if you have a nice, well-behaved cat. Um, it's it's really lovely to have them around the house. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. some cats can be quite a quite a nuisance. I don't like the ones that are all clawy clawy and bitey bitey. True, uh, true. As long as they're they're just cuddly cuddly, that's fine with me. <laughs> me too. I'm a big animal guy. Like I've always, yeah. my whole life, uh, I actually do like dogs quite a bit too. I like I I you know if I see a dog, I just can't I can't resist. I got to go pet yeah. the dog, right? Like it's just how I am. When I was growing up uh, in the States, um, California area, out in the kind of the more inland and also in Oregon, my grandpa had a ranch. So I also had, you know, grew up around horses and dogs and some sheep and different things here and there. And so I've always just been an animal guy. I love watching like birds. I, I, I live by the ocean now, I live on Vancouver Island. My wife's Canadian. So I like to go to the ocean a lot, see things. So I'm just I'm a big nature guy myself. Yeah. The the older I get, the more I relate to people who say that they prefer animals to people. <laughs> That's probably true, too, because, you know, more times than not, you know, it, it's a more enjoyable experience. Yeah, usually, yeah. It's true. It's true. Well, thank you for coming here. You've got a, a, a pretty big channel. Why don't you briefly talk about who you are in your channel? So I am Lloyd Evans. I am an ex-Jehovah's Witness. I was raised... Uh, in the Jehovah's Witness organization. Um, I was baptized at the age of 11 and obviously in the United Kingdom, which is where I was born. And I was a very firm believer. I, I pursued it very, very avidly and devoutly. Um, when I was 20 or 19 or 20, I started to doubt my beliefs. It was because a book came out regarding the book of Daniel, the Bible book of Daniel, and there were various um, interpretations of prophecy that I found myself disagreeing with, consciously disagreeing with. But then when I was 21, my mother died and uh, of breast cancer, mm. and this made me go deeper into the faith because what you're told as a Jehovah's Witness is, well, the only chance you have of seeing your mother again is if you stay as close as possible to the organization because she's not really dead. She's still alive in Jehovah's memory right. and he's going to bring her back in the resurrection to the future paradise. So right. if you want to be around to meet her um, or welcome her, um, you've got to 
stick with the with the truth as they call it so i took it very very seriously or i buried my doubts to the extent that i could and uh i progressed i guess for want of a better word um up the ranks in the organization i i went to a an elite school for um it was then only for men but it's since changed so that it, it allows women as well it's now called SKE, the School for Kingdom Evangelizers, but back, but back then it was called the Ministerial Training School. Mm. Uh, graduated from that, uh, was appointed an elder, and uh, then got married. Sorry, I got married first and then was appointed an elder. And it was when I moved to Croatia um, that I woke up because I was going to the Kingdom Hall, the local Kingdom Hall, and all of the indoctrination was in Croatian, which I didn't know. I, I was very, very slow to learn it. In fact, I'm so slow to learn it that I still don't speak it, and I've been in Croatia for 15 years now. Oh, funny. Um, so it, it just allowed me to mentally disconnect. It gave me the space I needed to question my, my beliefs or revisit the doubts that I'd started to have when I was 20. And, you know, within, within a few months, um, I was telling my then wife, you know, I, I'm not going to be in this. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to continue as a Jehovah's Witness. Mm. So I ended up uh, starting a website called then JWSurvey.org, which is now JWWatch.org. I wrote two books, um, one of which is called The Reluctant Apostate. The other, the other is called How to Escape from Jehovah's Witnesses. And I started a YouTube channel, which uh, has yeah has grown to a, a rather large size so that's my story condensed yeah yeah that, well, that's yeah you i mean you know i i haven't followed you for many many years but i definitely have seen your videos always you know popping up in my feeds when i'm looking up stuff here and there on jw's or different things or just looking for conversations and it's ironic you know in your what you've shared is because i think you may have the biggest youtube channel out there that is actually addressing the watchtower right jehovah's witnesses i think you have the biggest one uh I, i'm not the biggest ex jehovah's witness channel i think that's telltale um but oh telltale, really okay. telltale doesn't exclusively deal with jehovah's witnesses i'm more or less exclusively dealing with jehovah's witnesses i mean right. i do make forays into my atheism and um discussing the bible and like i've interviewed Bible scholars and uh, historians. Um, I've seen a few of those clips. I want to. I've, I've interviewed yeah. a few people where yeah. it's been, or, or maybe people from other um, groups, uh, such as uh, ex Scientologists. I've had Mike Grinder and Leah Remini on the show, and that kind of thing. So, oh, you actually had Leah Remini on your show? Yeah, oh, I interviewed I Leah. Wow. Well, she's a friend. We 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 keep in touch, and oh, wow. uh, she's been very very supportive. Hey, reach out to her and tell me I'd love to have her on my channel. That'd be <laughs> <Yeah>. fun. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I guess you could say that sort of seventy to eighty percent of my content is Jehovah's Witnesses, and by that definition, probably yeah, it is the largest. Yeah, that Jehovah's was what Witnesses I was originally channel. thinking because I, yeah. I actually didn't know about the other guy's channel. What's that one called? Telltale. Telltale. Okay, I'll have yeah. to look that one up. How do you spell? T E. I can't believe I'm promoting him, even though he's bigger than me. Uh, T E L L T A L E. Oh, okay, just like it sounds. He's a really okay. sweet okay. guy as well. Okay, okay. Uh, Owen, he's a lovely, a lovely man. Well, yeah. it's just I, I mean, like I didn't know about it, so it's it just causes my curiosity. I'm like, wow, okay, I'll go check this guy out. So no, yeah, that's cool. Well, so you you started your channel how long ago? About you say. It was 2012, and um, actually what prompted me to start making videos was um, there was a lawsuit in California where initially uh, Watchtower lost, I think, 30 million, uh, or, no, sorry, 28 million uh, in damages in a child sex abuse lawsuit. Um, this was kind of unheard of at the time. It was like right in the beginning when they, when they started to um suffer losses in the courts over their stance on uh child safeguarding right and um i had a friend who it was actually a friend who helped me set up my website and 
he reached out to me and he said, Lloyd, um, there's this huge lawsuit in um, in California and I'm noticing no one's really talking yeah. about it on YouTube. And he said, you can make videos. Why don't you make a video? So I was like, okay, um, okay, I'll, I'll make a video. So back then I was working sort of incognito because I was trying to fade from the organization and that meant keeping my identity secret. So it was before the time when I was appearing on camera. But I thought, well, what I can do is I can write a script and I can just do it as a montage video where I'm just showing images and the viewers are getting the information they need through the narration and I can even get someone else to do the narration so it's not my voice. I see. And so that's what I did and that was, it. I think to this day, if you if you look at my, if you go back to the earliest videos, that's I think the first one you're going to find. Okay. And um, yeah, it just from that point onwards, um, things came to a head in my personal life and actually what happened was um, we were expecting our first child and we were so determined that it wasn't going to be um, affected by Jehovah's Witness nonsense that we we named our child Jessica Liberty. Uh, I put Liberty right there in the name. Nice. And uh, we disassociated from the organization. Um, and one part of the process of disassociation was was to just be open. And, you know, I started being open about my story and I posted my story on my website and I, I made a video where I was open and it took two weeks for the elders to um, give me a phone call and say, Lloyd, we need to speak to you. Hmm. And uh, then I got summoned to the Kingdom Hall for an apostasy trial. And uh, that was interesting. I mean, I didn't need to go. But I, I went along sort of naively hoping that just by trying to eyeball these guys, I might be able to sow some seeds and, uh, you know, appeal to their humanity a little bit. But um, I think I was quite naive in thinking that in, in retrospect. And were you an elder at that time? Because you mentioned being an elder. Were you an elder at that time? Not when I came to Croatia. I, I actually okay. stood down. Um, okay. My my then wife and I were having problems, and that caused me to stand down. So when I came to Croatia, I was kind of approaching it as like a blank slate, and and wanting to kind of sort of rebuild my spirituality uh, as I as I saw it back then. And a friend of mine even told me he said, Lloyd, um, if you're wanting to rebuild your spirituality, you shouldn't be going to a country where you don't speak the language because you're not going to be able to understand what's being said for at least a period when you're going to the meetings and that's going to be dangerous for you. So I was like, no, no, I'll be fine. It'll be great. I'll just, just watch, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll learn the language, never learn the language. <laughs> I'll learn the language and I'll rebuild my spirituality. Just watch. And, uh, like I said, within a few weeks, I, I remember because it was too painful for me to say it to my then wife, I was, writing a um a her a handwritten letter and saying I, I don't think I'm gonna be mm. staying in the, in this religion for much longer. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot mouthful there. Mm. Well let's if you don't mind and you know we, we got a, kind of a time where we're gonna try and keep it on hour. So let's um how how so you were born into the organization and obviously your parents were kind of walk us back how far back of a generation does your family go before you became a Christian or became a Jovenist? Um, I was, uh, so my, it goes back uh, to my grandmother on my father's side. She was converted in, I can give you the year, 1953. Okay. Um, she had only recently lost both of her parents to some dreadful illness and she got a knock on the door. And I can fully understand why it would have been an appealing thing yeah, when people yeah. turn up and they're saying, hey, you know, uh, these parents of yours who've died, wouldn't you like to see them again? In a, yeah, in a who wouldn't want to say yes to that, right? Yeah. So she that's how the religion sort of first made landfall in my family tree. Um, on my mum's side, uh, my mum actually got converted um, 
after a tragedy where she lost her second husband in a fire and she got love bombed by Jehovah's Witnesses who she'd met previously in her life and um, yeah she just felt like they were caring about her more than her friends who weren't witnesses and it was around the time that Jehovah's Witnesses were predicting 1975 right as you know as the date for Armageddon I think she even got baptized in 1974 wow um so that would have been foremost in her thinking I'm pretty sure Wow. Um, After 74, 75 comes and goes. Comes and goes, yeah. comes around, you're like, what happened? But she but she obviously, you know, managed, she was one of the many Jehovah's Witnesses who managed to, you know, stay believing. She, she stuck it out. And she stuck it out, and she ended up meeting my dad, and, you know, they made babies. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the sort of the history of, Jehovah's Witnesses in my family. It doesn't go like too many generations. Back. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Mm. I, yeah. Because you know this full well. Like some can go way, 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 way back. Mm. I've talked to many who go back three, four, sometimes five generations. You're like, wow, that's a really long ways. Mm. So it's actually interesting to, you know, when you're when you're growing up and you're you're meeting people from your from your family who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses because again, it's it, it doesn't go that far back. So you're, you're meeting aunts and uncles. And I think, you know, my granddad never converted to, uh, on my mum's side, on my mum's side, my grandmother ended up converting, but my granddad didn't. And he, he was in world war two, um, in the merchant Navy. So he, he you know, and, and his ship got torpedoed by the Nazis. So he was kind of a war hero. Wow. And it was kind of weird to, I didn't have that much of a relationship with him, but it was, interesting to kind of be growing up conscious of the fact that not everyone in my family had the same you know uh, devotion to the organization but I was never really I either never had the opportunity to get to know these people or I or I didn't pursue the opportunity to get to know them better when I when I probably should have done so yeah yeah mm. yeah I like you know my wife did a little bit of she she'd done some research you know ancestry kind of stuff this and that and it's kind of fun sometimes you look back at your your lineage over the years right and a lot of people in my ancestry were definitely not christians or whatever else and in fact um as a side story maybe we could talk to that later but my both my parents were not christians when i was born either mm. uh they became christians after i was born so but uh it's kind of interesting when you look back through some of your lineage and your history like you know my wife was able to actually go back almost a thousand years like crazy with my my lineage I was like holy smokes and hmm. long how story short long, how long story you... short i was actually related back in the day with william the conqueror one of the bad kings oh, wow. <laughs> like wow where's my royalty like where you so know, you've got a bit of english in i you. do i'm irish and english i got a little bit of all that in there yeah so wow and how old were you when um because you say when you were born yeah. Um, your parents weren't Christians. So how old were you when they became Christians? I was three. So okay. I, I was born in 71. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, it's kind of an ironic story. If you don't, can I share for a minute? Is that okay? It's fine. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of um, trespassing a little bit in interviewing no, you. Oh, no. I'll don't try worry. to remember my place in all of this. But oh, I would be, I am genuinely oh, interested. If I'm to asking know. A, yeah. you to share your story, I should be completely transparent. To no, I, I, I want to know yeah. what, what the situation so, is. With yeah, you. so kind of like, well, that's great because you kind of shared where you got with your mm. channel and your stuff. And so some of my stories, yeah, both my parents, when they, I grew up in, uh, well, they were in California, Southern California when I was born. So they were both hippies, you know, back in the Woodstock kind of hippie movement back in that time. And uh, my mother became pregnant in 1970, and both my parents weren't married. And so eventually now they're going to get married. And I came into this world in 71. Now my parents became Christians when I was at the age of three. And it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a horrible story, but then it's a good story. So when my dad was being raised, my grandpa, um, I only got to meet him a little bit when I was younger because he died 
in 1976, so I would have been five. But before I was born and when my dad was younger, my grandpa was an alcoholic. Um, he used to beat my dad, beat my grandma. Uh, my dad had a sister that he, my grandpa never touched for whatever reason. And so as my dad was growing up, you know, he was, this was a constant thing to where he was getting beat pretty much on a regular basis. And it wasn't until probably, uh, according to him, his latter teens that he was able to somewhat start defending himself, right? Because that was a different era. Not like today, like if, if that's going on a regular basis, you know, people are locked up right away normally, mm -hmm. unless it's somehow concealed. But that was a lot of things were, you know, got away with back in those days, right? Yeah. So my dad had a really, he was very atheist, very anti-God, very anti-religion. You know, he was one of those guys that just like, you know, if someone talked about Jesus, he just, he wanted to pop you a, you know, a nice one. And so when I was born, you know, both my parents, and it's kind of funny me saying that because he was even a hippie. So he was kind of one of those angry hippies, um, which kind of makes, let me laugh. But um, my dad and being a drug driver, get into, you know, truck driving when, uh, just after I was born. And, uh, Somewhere in these few years, after being a dad, one of the things that my dad has told me is that he wanted to be, he wanted to raise me different than how he was raised. And this is, he was still good for atheist. him. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was still an atheist. And because he had such just a bad life when he was growing up, he wanted to say, you know what, I want to treat my son differently. And I want to try and give him a better life. And so I, I really commend my dad for that as well. Well, not to drag it out too long, but in his truck driving um, career, job, whatever, he came across a guy who was a Christian and uh, befriended my dad. And somehow he was a truck driver as well. He was able to how build this connection, friendship, where somehow my dad was able to listen and, and actually want to have a conversation. And so in this discussion uh, and conversations over time somewhere in that that wall of anti-god anti-religion anti-jesus that kind of stuff those layers were coming down and at some point he eventually said you know what i want to believe in jesus i want to i want to know what you know talk to this other guy and so he this guy would talk to him about you know who jesus was he was real really lived really died these things that we actually can see in the Bible, there's there's some validity, of course, to these things. Uh, some things in the Bible, I, I know you would also agree that there's some things that just can't be proved, but there's some things that do have historical fact as well. And so my dad became a Christian as well as my mother when I was three. And my dad had a radically, like it wasn't, it wasn't religion. And I think you understand what I'm trying to say. It wasn't religion. It was something about Jesus that made my dad his life just changed. I, I would call it a miracle myself personally, where according to my dad, that wasn't, you know, I can't remember when I was three, but people who knew him knew how he was before and now how he was now putting his faith in Jesus. And so, and it all just really revolved about grace because my dad had a lot of things that he did wrong as we all, we all do. But when he understood what grace meant, according from a biblical point of view, he realized, man, God does really love me. That this, it's not about religion. It's not about organization. It's not about just a bunch of rules, even though there are rules that are good in life to do. You know, don't go around just do whatever you want because there's obviously going to be bad consequences with that. And so that was my upbringing. So my dad raised me as, you know, teaching these things, but I, had a, I still had a choice in the matter. So I became uh, a Christian at the age of six a few years later, but it was always by choice. And even as I was growing up, it was never forced upon me. It was never pressed upon me. Um, sadly, as like you had certain things you shared about your story, my parents divorced when I was at the age of 10. So just really, you know, no other nice way to say it just stinks. Both separated, and I went with my dad, and we ended up moving to Las Vegas, and my mother went to Reno, and um, so I lived a lot of my years in Las Vegas, and during my preteens and teenage years, I was kind of not really doing the church scene, 
really, you know, my dad was kind of he fell away for a time as well. It wasn't a really to about the 1990s after high school. I graduated in 1990. That um, growing up in lot, you know, my teenage years in Las Vegas. It's interesting because I never denied being a Christian or being a follower of Jesus. I just wasn't going to church and wasn't always living out the Christian life like, you know, as we should anyway, if you want to put it in those terms. But I never stopped believing. And it was uh, after high school, I had one of my friends that I used to go out partying with in high school, doing the drinking scene, doing certain, certain things. Um, calls me up one day and says, hey, Kelly, you know, I haven't talked to him for a bit. And he says, hey, Kelly, I'm a Christian now. I'm like, and he was an atheist before, just to be very clear, right? He was very atheist. I was like, whoa, that's, uh, that's different. And he kind of explained to me that he got in a car accident, um, which he should have been killed. He was in the hospital. Uh, and some nice elderly ladies came and was doing their rounds, which back in those days, that was a normal thing, going in hospitals, talking about Jesus. And so his story was he became a Christian. I was like, wow, okay. So he wanted to start going to church. And this is roughly now 1991 time frame. And uh, so we start doing some church hopping back in Las Vegas days. And some of my upbringing, I had some good roots that I knew certain things, of course, that were grounded in me through the scriptures. So some of these churches that we were checking out, I could tell were just more of the sensationalism, you know, the late night TV circus acts kind of people. I was like, well, okay, we don't want to stay here too long. And then being a single guy after high school, living on my own, having a job, same with him, a little bit of time elapsed where we weren't always hanging out as much. And he was dating a girl that I didn't know much about. And so he was dating a girl for a bit and then introduced me to his girlfriend and ended up being a Latter-day Saint, Mormon. And within a short time, he got converted to Mormonism. So he went from his experience of being in a car accident, then believing in Jesus, doing some hanging out with me, but then we had a time where we weren't. And then in that time, he was dating this Latter-day Saint, and then he became mean a Latter-day Saint. And I was like, wow, okay, this is interesting. Now, in my previous experience, you know, being a Christian, I knew a little bit about, you know, Catholics and a little bit about different people here. And then I had friends in high school who were, you may know the term, Jack Mormons, Jack Jehovah's Witnesses, where they were, they would show up, but during the week, you know, hanging out with their buds and doing whatever they wanted to do kind of thing. So I had some friends that were Latter-day Saints, or I knew about that. But I didn't know much about the Book of Mormon. I knew nothing about Joseph Smith. I knew nothing about the Mormon church and all that. So he introduces me to his girlfriend. And she was like a fifth or sixth generation. I think it's fifth. But she had a lineage that went back to Brigham Young. She was actually in the lineage of Brigham Young, the second prophet of the LDS church. So had probably about, if I remember my recollection, about an hour conversation. He was there and she was there and she was you know, trying to share with me the Joseph Smith story. And I'll try to wrap it up here. Um, I just didn't, it just didn't jive with me. Something just didn't connect with this story about Joseph Smith and the claim. Finding the golden plates. Golden plates. God the Father and Jesus Christ literally appeared to him. And mm. the whole, you know, for 18 centuries, there was no truth, no true organization or church was here kind of like a little bit of with the charles russell kind of ancient thing. jews crossing the atlantic in a boat yeah, yeah central americas i was just like just <laughs> just just so much that was being shared with me i was just like it just didn't jive so mm. i ended up leaving i thought i was kind but apparently i wasn't kind enough because she told him that well you can't keep dating me if you want to hang out with your friend kelly that was the oh. ultimatum she gave my friend david right ouch Okay. So we were best friends. So, of course, he did his cross the fingers behind the back. Yeah, I won't talk to Kelly. And so he kept dating her for a little bit while longer, but we were still buds. Um, what ended up happening is he ended up no longer dating her. And sadly, I want to say this, he ended up going back to being an atheist mm -hmm. after that experience. But the fast forward now through that experience with him, it really made me rethink myself. Why am I a Christian? I have friends who are Muslims mm -hmm. that believe in Jesus, quote unquote. They had friends that were Jehovah's Witnesses, 
Latter-day Saints. And I was like, all these different groups of people, then there's so many more. They believe in Jesus, but we're all so different. And why are we different? And, and you look at the Bible, and not I don't want to go into preach mode right now, but the Bible warns about another Jesus, another gospel, and things like that. And I was like, okay. So it, it caused me to really reevaluate my, my life as a Christian. And so I make this joke. How old are you, Lloyd? 44. Okay, so you're, you're, you're not, I'm 52. So you'll, you'll kind of get some of the joke. So I'm living in Las Vegas. It's roughly 1992 now as time has been going on, 91, 92. I'm reevaluating my life. And I'm like, you know what? Google didn't exist. The internet didn't exist. That didn't come till 93. So I've got my friends, different places. Of course, my parents are Christians. Um, I was checking out some Christian churches at the time, but I was like, you know what? I need to know is this Jesus guy real? Like, did he really live? Are there things in the Bible that actually have some, you know, truth to it? So I went to a place called a library. That's my joke. And back in those days, libraries were very different than they are today. You could go into these, like these rows and rows and rows of history and they would have religious stuff and history and archeology. span And so long story short, I found out that this Jesus guy really did exist. He was real. There's evidence for the crucifixion. There's lots of things documented. There's things in the Bible that have real places, not the Central Americas like the Book of Mormon and the golden plates and stuff that's made up, right? There's real things. So it kind of gave me this push to now where over this last 30 years is kind of what I've been into apologetics and learning about different religions and then talking to various people. And that's kind of been my push to really know what it what it means to believe in Jesus. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I totally respect you. I think I, I think one thing that we both have in common, because, we, you know, I, I'm an atheist, obviously, and you're a believer. And it, it sounds from what you're saying, like we both share a um, a craving for truth. Like we we don't want to be lied to and we don't want to waste time believing things that aren't true. Now, we've both arrived at vastly different worldviews, but I think bottom line, neither of us want to have stuff in our heads that isn't reality, you know, sure. unless it's Star Wars or some <laughs> some, some film like that we Wars. enjoy. Yeah, I like Star Wars, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I, I definitely respect you um, going to the library and and, um, and doing your research. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that. And one other component, thank you, I appreciate that. One other component is, is, is from that, after doing that back, back in those days, one of the things that I also learned was that when I'm talking to people of other faiths, I didn't want to go off of what someone else told me, even though they might have been mm. true. I started going in the streets and talking to actual Jehovah's Witnesses or yeah. Latter-day Saints or my friends. And so... Like, I, I won't show all my show and tell, but like, you know, over the years, I've gathered some of this. You you probably have more than I do, but I've got like, um, you know, the the time at hand, you know, one of the originals with Charles Russell, creation, vindication. Um, I've acquired. I, I bet I can beat you. You probably can. Let's see what you got. This is the... Um... An earlier version of what? What? What year is yours? Hey, folks, Let's have a look. This is a 1907 copy. Oh, you yeah. got me by one year. Mine is 1908. Oh wow, that is. But that isn't that interesting because they they um the the year is actually crucial because um Charles Taze Russell was a bit slimy and he did literally change the text. He did. Yes, so he. Did. he the 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 studies in the scriptures, or as it was first called, Millennial Dawn. Yes. Um, it's a different book depending on what year you have. It's true. <laughs> in there many definitely, cases, definitely yeah. revisions for sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's funny. Mm. Um, I've got you know the creation book as well. You know that's it's it's kind of been abused or whatever over the years. Um, but I've I've kept it intact. I've got uh, two. Good for you. The, I've yeah. got two of the original. Uh, 1950, uh, yeah. the New Testament, when they first came out with the New World Translation, right? Fantastic. Um, 
I still got, uh, I used to have the 1985. I gave it away a while back, but I've got the 1969. I've got a lots of these things, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm just showing a few things, but I've, I've acquired over the years and I've got things with that, like with Mormons and Muslims and other groups, because yeah, what I want to do, what I was saying a moment ago is I wanted to be able to, I want to check things out. Mm -hmm. And so instead of someone telling me, Hey, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are false, you know, they've got false prophecies or whatever it may be. And then I go talk to these people like, well, wh where did we say that? And you can't actually say it. I want to know it for myself, you know, why? Or I want to know why. I want to know why they believe what they believe. Yeah. Certain things, you know, I've got magazines and books, you know, all kinds of stuff. You have all this stuff probably way more than I do. I know that. But I wanted to know firsthand the same thing like what I was doing with my Christian faith. I wanted to know things firsthand, right? The best that I could. And so anytime I ever talk to anybody, whether it be, you know, a Muslim, a Mormon, Jehovah Witness, or even, you know, even atheists, I, I try to be up to date on certain people out there of atheists, kind of, you know, spokesmen, people, whatever else, and hmm. want to know because I like to have intriguing, good conversations with people and, not just go off, you know, off the cuff and say Good something. You. Like, oh, this is, you know, this is what someone else told me, and they they heard it from such and such, and yeah, and it sounds like one of those really sad country songs, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, the the only issue is, um, you know, belief and faith can be a deeply personal thing, can't it? And yes, um, one Jehovah's Witnesses' reasons for believing might be slightly different from another Jehovah's Witnesses. Right. reasons for believing and um like when it comes to the publications um they would class this as old light correct so, so some some religions are very proud of their older publications yeah. yeah and to a degree jehovah's witnesses are as well because you know they're they're happy to kind of show it in museum exhibits at their yeah. visitors this centers. is where we used to be but we're getting brighter yeah. and brighter and brighter but it's all about the aesthetics it's like look at these beautiful old books that we used to make don't look yeah. at what's inside but yeah. just look at them kind of with the covers closed that's yeah. how we want you to look at them yeah uh don't read what's inside because it's old light and yeah. um that you know i i don't buy that thinking because um the organization teaches to this day that the leaders were chosen in 1919 as god's faithful slave right and you know my thinking is well if god's going to choose any group to be his spokesperson in a particular year we should be able to go to the literature that that group was um, distributing in that year and see something unique, see something that, wow, I can see why Jesus would choose this group, you know? And, the, you know, the, the, sad, the sad truth is that when you actually look at the, what they were printing around that time, um, it was absolutely crazy. It was loon, you know, we'd lock people away for, for sure. saying what they were saying yeah. back then. Yeah. Um, and yet this is apparently the group that Jesus chose to be his faithful and discreet slave. So, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Mm. Yeah. It's, and I think what you said a minute ago, I really I, I respect that as well. I think, you know, we're both like me and you on journey. And I think other many people listening, I mean, we're all on a journey. Everybody's mm. on a journey. Yeah. I think we all have all the same information, like, you know, mm. especially with the internet world we have today, there's so much out there that people can look up, good stuff, bad stuff, biased stuff, whatever. Um, but with what you said a moment ago, just to be, you know, I want to go off what you said, mm. I think it's it's the pursuit of truth. And I think yeah, that's something that I've really taken myself uh, over the years is mm. I, I want to be open to truth. I don't want to hold on to something just to hold on to because mommy and daddy told me this, right? Good for you. Yeah. Um, and that's, I've always been never afraid of truth. I always like, look, you know, even like the Bible says, Jesus, Paul says, if Christ wasn't crucified, we're all dead in our sins. Like there's, mm. there's no point that the whole new Testament, in my opinion, hinges on the resurrection. Like you, a, a dead Messiah means nothing to me, mm. right? You can claim all this stuff and all this stuff happened, but if the resurrection didn't take place, then it all, in my opinion, crumbles, you know, so the same thing with like an organization with the watchtower or 
Joseph Smith with LDS, like you look at the foundation and the roots, if their roots don't have anything to hold on to, nothing to really be anchored and planked into, then really what is there to hold on to, right? Mm. Yeah. And I think what what does make things complicated is that, uh, you know, like I said, truth matters to both of us. Um, but I, I, I think sometimes you can want something to be true badly enough. Yep, that's true that too. You'll, that you'll find reasons why it's true. Yep. And and you'll block out the reasons that why it isn't true. Yep. And you know, th this this is one way of describing, I guess, cognitive dissonance. And the thing with cognitive dissonance is we all have it and we need it. It's a it's a survival instinct that we have because it helps to preserve our sense of self. You know, our our sense of self is um, a very powerful thing. And it's all tied up with our beliefs and convictions. Our beliefs and convictions help define who we are. And if it were possible to just walk up to someone in the street and show them a piece of information and switch them straight away from being a Jehovah's Witness to a Mormon or being Never a happened. Republican to a Democrat, <laughs> yeah. if, if our sense of self were that fluid that we could just do that, um, we wouldn't have any integrity as as no. beings it would we would be just tossed back and forth all the time yeah yeah so cognitive dissonance actually serves a, a vital purpose but it can also cause us to hold on to things um that, ma that they might give us comfort and they might serve some utility in giving us some degree of peace but that doesn't in itself make make them true you know? true no you're right no i mean um, yeah there's a lot of sincere people Mm. And and that and like and I say that with whether they be Muslim, still Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists, yeah. Christians, whatever, um, a lot of sincere people. Uh, mm. And like you said, they hold on to certain things or they want to believe certain things because it's just, it's just who we are, yeah. right? And and I and I'm and I, I'm very frank. Like you know, a lot of us who are raised, you know, or become somehow affiliated with some type of religious background as you would know rightly too, none of us want to all of a sudden go, wow, I was deceived. I was lied to. Yeah. That I mean that nobody wants that. Nobody wants to experience that. But I think if we are in this life, because at least from what I understand, we only get one shot at this. Um, we want to be open to what the truth is and be able to be open enough to be humble to acknowledge something that we may be wrong on. Right. Mm. And so that's, that's been my goal. I've, I've tried to be, I've, I'm still growing. I'm 52 and I'm still trying to learn humility and yeah. being humble. Um, I know I fail at times, but it's something that I do try. Well, we can only try, can't we? You yeah. know, we can only do our best. Yeah. So we have so a little bit of time um, and we really haven't gotten to the big kahuna, but before we get to the kahuna, um, what was, I guess, just one quick thing, when you were contemplating back in the day of coming out of the org, what was what, what was a couple of things that really was that process that got you going, if you can remember that far back? So when you say what was the process, do you mean what were the most um, there was a time when convincing you were arguments firm, that there was led a, me? There was a time where you were firmly believing it. Yeah. But then there was a time where you slowly either noticed something or something stood out to you and it started giving you those quote unquote questions. Well, I, I have to go back again to when I was reading that, that, that book on the prophecy right. of Daniel and right. Daniel. Gotcha. And there were, there was just the, I'll give you an example. So, um, that particular book, which is almost certainly now considered old light. Um, although it's, you can still download it, I think on the website. And, yeah, and it's, it's that it. little Daniel booklet, right? I have it. I can too show somewhere. you. I have it's it not somewhere. Quite, it's not immediately to hand, but um, yeah, it's called Daniel's prophet. Uh, yeah, um, I have that book. Yeah, I have that. Pay attention book. to Daniel's prophecies. What I got it's called. that one. Yeah. Okay. And um, one of the visions that Daniel has is of an immense image, where the the head is of gold, um, the chest plate is of silver the um 
abdomen is of copper or what have, what have you, and it goes down to the legs, which are made of iron, and then uh, the feet are made of iron mixed with clay. And um, in this particular, when it was explaining this prophecy, it said, well, the the legs are the Roman Empire. This, by the way, goes all the way back to William Miller, I later found out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the great. Adventists. Yeah, yeah Miller. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. It wasn't like a Jehovah's Witness exclusive Russell thing. got a lot of his stuff from them. Yeah. Yeah. So they, but they said the um, that the Roman Empire turned into the uh, Anglo-American world power, which they still believe is a thing. Um, anyone who actually pays attention to politics and the relationship between America and Britain knows that that's not how it that's works. That's not but, true. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They they call it the Anglo-American world power, and they say, well, you know, Britain was part of the Roman Empire once, and Britain went on to become its own power and um you know uh, america and what have you and blah 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 so that's the lineage that it gives you for that particular prophecy and then it explains the king of the north king of the south prophecy and says rome um becomes uh, nazi germany <laughs> and um i'm thinking hang on a minute you just said rome becomes britain and now you're saying in another prophecy that rome becomes nazi germany that's funny. What well, wasn't Nazi Germany at war with Britain? <laughs> so, That's funny. So there were the Rome. There, there, there wasn't any Rome. consistency in how they yeah. were explaining things. So yeah, yeah. I think that sort of thing just stays with you. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. True. All all you can do is try to pretend it's not there. Yeah. And I spent years and years trying to pretend that, and many other things just weren't there. And it all came to a head um, one day when when I was in Croatia and um, my family had gone to the meeting, I'd stayed behind. I was, I think I was kind of throwing a bit of a sickie. I, I wasn't really ill, but I was saying I was ill. And I thought, I'm going to sit down at the table and I'm going to write down all of the things about the Jehovah's Witness religion that I don't agree with. And by the end, by the time I'd finished, I'd managed to fill an entire page. And there were actually nine things. I call them my nine grievances. And some of them weren't massive. Some of them were pretty big deals, at least to me back then. Um, but I, when I finished and I look, I look at the piece of paper, I'm like, well, just by virtue of the fact that you've been able to put pen to paper and turn into writing the things that are in your head, you are no longer a Jehovah's Witness. And that was a very powerful moment for me. And I think from that point forwards to invoke Daniel again the writing was on the wall yeah. and uh yeah I knew I knew that I was on my way out yeah okay yeah that makes sense because I mm. think I've heard quite a few and you've, you've I know you've probably talked to lots of ex-witnesses over the years as well um mm. a lot have shared you know dates with you know back in the day with 1874 1878 mm. the 1914 the 1915 the 1917 the 1918 the 1925 and the list goes on right like yeah you look at all these changed prophecies that take place over time, and at some point you say, what's going on here, right? And the same thing what you said there with that Daniel book, changing Rome and changing how it's... If you know, it was a changing. basketball player taking a penalty and they just missed time and time and time they wouldn't we wouldn't be giving them like they a would 20th be fired or, right they'd be out of here we wouldn't be giving them a 20th or 30th opportunity to redeem themselves no. we'd all be bored by that point you know so. <laughs> i had a joke but i'm gonna keep that one in that's funny yeah yeah um that's funny so let's fast forward so now um i'd love maybe have a second chat with you down the road because i can see time is going fast here but mm. um where you're at today so you have you know you 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 left the org how many years ago about you say uh i was 30 and i'm now 44 so 14 I years guess four, okay. 14 so years roughly ago, yeah. 2011 okay yeah uh, or wait no 2000 yeah around 2010 2011 okay. yeah 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 and so in that time you know you've you've been through a lot your your progression um uh you're an atheist, no doubt. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no, there's no hiding that at all. Mm -hmm. um, through your experiences, um, what kind of? I mean, like, this, this is not an uncommon thing. Many people who have left LDS, who have left 
witnesses or whatever. A lot of, a lot of people do become atheists over time. Um, what kind of led you there to where maybe you didn't pursue, say, another type of religious faith? Why are you an atheist? I did, um, when I was first exiting Jehovah's Witnesses and realizing that it wasn't true, I did uh, identify as a, as a Christian. Mm. Uh, I read Crisis of Conscience. I don't know whether you've yep. got that book. I'm familiar with it. I don't have it. Um, because Raymond Franz was a governing body member and right. he wrote this amazing book um, just dismantling uh, the religion and, th and the theology. He defected and um, he was kind of hounded out of the organization during uh, this crazy witch hunt for, for apostates. And that was and written in the 70s, right? I can't remember what year it was. It was, it was actually published in 1983. Oh, okay. And okay. so, like, one of the first things I did when I first gave myself permission to really investigate um, was, you know, find a, a PDF. I think it was a PDF back then. And I read it, and it just blew my mind. And um, Ray Franz was coming from the position of, you know, this this is not true Christianity, but you can be a Christian without having an organization to attach yourself to. You know, that Jehovah's Witnesses sell you this idea that the only way you can possibly possibly be a Christian is if you associate with a visible organization on the earth. And I'm here yeah. to tell you that's not true. You can be, you know, your relationship with Jesus is, is your personal relationship with Jesus. And you can have a personal relationship with Jesus without having an organization to arrange that for you and actually it's more fulfilling when you do that when you when you have your own personal relationship so i was kind of down with that um it's just i think what what really tipped the scales towards atheism was um i started to kind of go on youtube and see what people were saying you know i was finally able to stomach what atheists were saying and I watched some um, videos, video debates featuring Christopher Hitchens. Yeah, I'm familiar with them. Okay. And um, they just floored me. They just mm. wow. Um, and he had he had a way of. He obviously died in 2011, but he just had this way of putting things. And I felt like w with Christopher Hitchens, it was like a breath of fresh air because I'd spent years being infantilized by. Jehovah's Witnesses and treated like a child and having things explained to me like I'm a child and to this day they do it where they they speak down at you and they when you watch the JW broadcasting and you watch their videos everything is put in these baby like terms and Christopher Hitchens was uh, just speaking to me like I was an adult it felt like yeah. and um, and just putting things bluntly and I, and I I really responded to that, and um, then obviously started to look more into the atheist position. And I just thought, you know what, I I um, I, th I think to begin with, I I identified as agnostic, okay. and I, I came to settle on agnostic atheist, which means, um, you know, I'm not saying God isn't real. I'm not saying God doesn't exist. I'm just not a believer in any religion or any theist God until I can see evidence that would persuade me to believe. So, Okay, no, that makes yeah. sense. And, and I actually didn't know that part of your your life. And so... Yeah, I haven't spoken about that a great deal or, yeah. in, or in those terms, but that's pretty much... If I'm going to boil it down for the sake of time, I think, that, I think we have to blame it on Hitch. We have to blame it on Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> yeah. Too bad you couldn't have came across Dr. Walter Martin. There we go. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that makes um, that makes some sense. I mean, like, there's there's certain people that, like, well, I just mentioned like Dr. Walter Martin. You probably are familiar with him. No. Oh, oh, really? Okay. No. He uh, he wrote a book many years ago. He passed away in 1989. But um, Kingdom oh, the Kingdom of, of the, the I, that yeah. that title rings a bell. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. he um, I don't want to get too long on him, but he, he was a guy back in the 60s and 70s and 80s that was a Christian who was kind of one of these weirdo guys that was actually mm. doing kind of like what I do, talking to people on the streets, going out and interacting with people. And then he would go to churches and talk about things. And he'd have like a, 
an open mic where people could come. This is old school back in the churches where people could come up, grab a mic, mm. ask a question. So he'd get challenged a lot from different people, of different faiths. And anyway, what I liked about him is he didn't baby you. Mm. He spoke to you, you know, where you were at. He was graceful, but he was also bold. And he, and he gave a good, I believe, a good witness, a good example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so yeah. a lot of my life has kind of, in a way, I've learned things from him as well. So it's kind mm. of interesting that where you kind of maybe caught, caught with Hitchens, where I kind of caught with Martin. Yeah. And it's interesting. So I, uh, I wonder, I have to Google if they ever talked with each other. It would be kind of interesting if they ever did. It would be fascinating because he did <laughs> debate. um that was his whole thing and that this is what made him so compelling because if, if it was just him like giving sermons or what have you i don't i think i would have immediately switched off but it, it, what um i was obviously coming i was approaching him from the perspective of someone who who wanted to believe and, and considered himself a believer and i was seeing him doing these debates with um basically christian apologists yeah um in, including dr william lane craig and yeah um, all Didn't he have some of... debates also with Le uh, John Lennox as well? And yeah, John Lennox. The, the John yeah. Lennox one was good, and he also yeah. did a, a debate on Catholicism, which I found. I, I mean, he absolutely wiped the floor with the Catholics. Yeah, it was. Well, it, it, you, I, it I was... don't want to be rooting a Catholic, but that one's not too hard. Really, I, know. <laughs> yeah. so, I think yeah. we both. I think you would have even you would have enjoyed some of the things he was look, saying I'll have to, that about one about the Catholic Church in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I have seen, and I have seen some mm. of the debates with Hitchens. I mean, he is a good speaker. Yeah, he is very um, confident. Yeah, in what he presents, and, and and there have been some very good debates he's had with some Christians in the past, back and forth. So I, I do get that. So it, it seems me and you have some similar type of experiences and journey in regards to where we've landed. Yeah. But, um, at the same time, both of us are still pursuing truth i believe right i so. think so and i i relate to what you said earlier about still being on a journey um i definitely don't think i'm i'm at any particular destination and we had i had an experience recently which i think you're probably referring to when you say kahuna yeah well um, why don't we get to that while we got some time left so you i one of your videos i think you said um i met god and uh, I watched it and it talked about you had an experience where you were, I think, under some type of mushrooms or whatever. And yeah, correct me if I'm wrong when I'm done. But like you in your your video, you're like, well, I don't know if it was real or not. If it was hallucinating. But you had this experience where you believed you were talking and meeting God somehow. And it kind of opened up, at least from what I understood, some thoughts for you to be mm. open to the possibility of there being some God out there. Am I correct? Yeah, I think you've summed it up nicely. Um, and it was a very strange experience for me to have as an atheist to be having a, a conversation with another consciousness that was identifying as God. Yeah. Um, and in a strange way, it's kind of, it's very ironic because I, I obviously uh, would have killed for that when I was a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I would have... When I was actually a believer, that was the time, really, to be having that. Um, and now, and now I have it when I'm an atheist. And I was even saying to it, because it 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 made it very clear early early on that it wasn't to be referred to as a he or a she. It was an an uh, that it, that okay. it was a that or an it. And I, now I refer to it as it. But um, I forget where I was going with it. But um, yeah, it was um, a very, very unexpected uh, encounter. And I think, like like you've summed it up quite well, what I said in the, in the video, I, I've said um, it could be like the rational explanation and the one that I'm leaning towards more, if I'm being completely honest, is that it was a hallucination. Okay. Um, but I just feel like I'm at that stage in my life. You know, I'm 44. Um, why do I have to rush? you know why do i have to rush in coming to firm conclusions it's not like anyone's holding a stopwatch you know i i i just get to freeze this state of slight uncertainty and and enjoy it you know yeah um so i'm leaning towards it being a hallucination that's that's the kind of the obvious um explanation for what happened uh just like a simple product of of brain chemistry of of the psilocybin you know reacting with my 
physiology. Right. Um, and I, I did a little bit of research because I'm not very familiar with the, the, the magic mushroom kind of thing or whatever. Yeah. So I was looking it up and I was like, okay, you know, because I, I have, like when I said I was growing up years ago, I had friends that did drugs. Um, yeah. I did lots of drinking, but I never did drugs. And so I had friends that did LSD and other things and they would be, sometimes I'd be like, what is going on with my friend? He's he's seeing mm. things. He's like, who are you talking to? He's like, don't you see him or what? I'm like, yeah, there's nobody there. He's like, oh, dude, you know, and he's doing this stuff. I'm like, so I know I'm not trying to be silly. Yeah. But I know hallucination stuff. So I want to look up the mushroom thing. And, you know, I respect what you said, because what I found out, too, is because there have been people who are Muslim and other people of other faiths who said they took as an experiment, I found some stuff that they took it as an experiment to see what would happen. And other people of the faith said they also had some type of experience by doing it. And so um, it's interesting, nonetheless, that it does kind of make your mind kind of go somewhere else, right? And so I want to take that, though, with, and let you go back to what you're saying, but what with doing what happened or seeing what happened with you, the experience, whether it was real or not, and if you're leaning towards it being more of a hallucination, which I would kind of lean towards might as well myself and not any type of judgmental way what has that done for you now since then to now with your thought process where, where are you at today on that um it's just i think it's allowed me to be way more uh empathetic with people of of faith i mean i like to think i was quite empathetic to begin with you know to the extent where i've had many conversations um both on and on and off camera um over the course of my activism career with with people who are believers and um you know i've always tried to approach those conversations with kind of the utmost respect um but i feel like um just the sense of absolute conviction uh, that you get when you're in that situation because the conversation was as real as the conversation I'm having with you now, you right. know, um, at least in the moment. And, um, yeah, it just allows me to relate to people of faith a little bit more, I think. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know how else to put it. Oh, well, that, that, that um, that's great. Don't keep going. Keep Don't let me interrupt you. Go ahead. So I, I actually, what I haven't, what I didn't mention in the video because it hadn't happened yet, um, you're referring to the video titled, I Met God, Brackets on Shrooms. Yeah. And uh, I went back and did another trip. I waited, uh, it, it was maybe just over a month from the first trip and um, I did another trip. Oh, interesting. And I was interested to know whether it would happen again because I'd, what I've learned is that um, when people take uh, magic mushrooms, um, it's not a given that they're going to have that sort of experience. So I was half expecting it to be, a, you know, a bit of a letdown. Um, but I actually <laughs> recorded myself this time just in case I had another conversation. And, and I did. And it wow. was quite a long conversation. Yeah. And um and I'm, I'm going to be honest, you know, like I've, I've played the tape back to myself and it sounds like I'm just crazy. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> it almost if, looks like when you're watching like one of those people that have that thing on their head where they can see stuff. And if, it's like, you know, and they're looking this virtual thing and they're and they're doing all this and that and whatever else. But no one else is like, what's going on? If anyone ever wanted to get me into a padded cell and a straitjacket, all <laughs> they'd need to do <laughs> is, is forward this recording to the Croatian oh, authorities. Man. And I, I think I I'd be in that situation if, pretty quickly. I imagine if you uploaded that, you'd probably have billions of views. That'd be crazy. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, even though to, even though I'm I'm listening to it half with an ear for how would this sound to someone else? Oh, they'd think I was crazy. I'm also listening to it when I when I have listened to it from the perspective of what was I feeling then and what was it like for me then and and I'm able to separate it from me so in other words it's speaking through my voice and i'm speaking back through my voice and it's a little bit confusing as to who's saying what when you're listening it it, it sounds like uh, someone who's who's schizophrenic you Just know talking to yourself i gotcha yeah 
it's two personalities using sharing the same voice. Yeah. Um, and and that makes it obviously very confusing to listen to. But uh, you know, when I was listening to, it, I was able to a little bit differentiate between who was who, and who was saying what. And actually, the the thing that I haven't shared this with anyone yet. So this is this is wow. a prime time. Yeah. Um, I is my camera working? It just froze for a moment. You're good. So I was quite anxious for some kind of tangible proof from it. Um, you know, like I said, I, I want to believe in things that are true, and I don't want to. You know, I quite enjoy have. I'll, I'll take the hallucinations; it's fun. But I also, if it is God, I want to. I'm the sort of person who wants to kind of fast track the evidence and get that out of the way. You know, and what I came up with was um i wanted to I, I was demanding from it um a mathematical equation um because i'd i watched an interview um from a professor i forget his name but he was saying about consciousness and he was saying about how if we had the mathematical equation for the for consciousness it could revolutionize technology it could it could, you know, be a huge leap forward in in what we're able to do, and so I thought, well, there's something I can ask for. So I was demanding the mathematical equation for consciousness, and um, it wouldn't give it to me, obviously. But then I'm thinking back afterwards, and I'm thinking, well, if there is a mathematical theory of consciousness, it's not going to be something as simple as e equals m c squared. <laughs> it's going to be a bloody long thing, and. Um, but then having said that, um, I know that it's, I feel like it would be capable of making me write something down that would be understandable if, if, it, if it were able, if it wanted to share that information, it could as do. As long so... as it's not reformed Egyptian, you're going to be over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Joseph Smith with yeah. his reformed Egyptian. Yeah. Um, so it was just kind of like a an exercise that I, I, I kind of tasked myself with. And it was, I guess my way of tethering myself to reality my way of kind of saying no i want to do this on my terms and i'm, I'm not just gonna go barreling forward with the and, and making all of these assumptions that you are god if, if i can't have something back if i can't have something that i can actually go that would convince other people that's i'm not just interested in convincing myself that this is god i'm interested in convincing other people and if i and if i can't convince other people then maybe it is just a hallucination you know but even then, um, I'm still allowing myself to just hit that that pause button, and rather than rushing to any firm conclusion, um, partly because it's just such an enjoyable experience to 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 go in there and to be in a different reality see, where that, I can see. Doctor Pepper does that for me, so you know I. <laughs> If you have I mean, too many Dr. Peppers, maybe. Yeah, I've, I think sometimes yeah. when I was growing up, I think my dad used to... Or maybe to they're inject, slipping something in you, Dr. Peppers. I think Peppers. my dad used to inject me with Dr. Pepper when I was a baby. So that, I'm, Maybe I'm it's a spiked silly. Dr. Pepper. Who knows? Yeah, I'm just being silly. So I'm, I'm, just, in, I'm just kind of um, enjoying it, really, because the, the great thing about... Uh, and I don't want to plug magic mushrooms too much, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it's clinically proven that um, psilocybin has positive uh, effects there on is, mental there health is on the medicine side, for sure, and, yeah. and and alleviates depression. And yeah. and so I, um, I made a, a conscious decision, albeit a rather risky one, to come off my traditional um, anti or my um, pharmaceutical uh, antidepressants. And switch to psilocybin as my medication. Gotcha. And um, so, on, on a serious note, that's kind of what I'm most interested in is 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 just keeping on an even keel with my with my mental health. And the the effects of the first trip were so overwhelmingly positive that I'm um, I'm really thrilled that there's this um, thing that's from nature. I mean, I mean, they call it a drug. You know, really, truthfully speaking, it's just something that's in the in the ground. You know, sure. <laughs> I mean, do, do we call carrots a drug? You know, um, so I'm I'm just thrilled that there's something that can just get me on an even keel with my mental health and anything 
Uh, other than that, anything of a psychedelic nature or anything of a speaking with other consciences nature is just like a like a, an added bonus. It's just almost there as entertainment. Yeah. Um, but rather than again writing it off as just pure hallucinations and pure um, purely the result of my brain chemistry reacting to the psilocybin, um, I'll I'll hit the pause button and I'll I'll. Um, suspend disbelief. What well, sounds like to me, Lloyd, what you're sharing, I mean, you know, these are real experiences, at least you believe you've had, mm. whether, you know, hallucinations or whatever. Um, and there is a, like, you know, there is controversy on in regards to what the mushrooms do and don't do. And, mm. But there have been things out there that have, as you said, I'm, I'm not in this field, so this is not my, mm. field, but that have shown that this has helped people with depression and things like that too. So, there's other other drugs that people or, or quote unquote things that people use. So, yeah. But what I like what you said though, Lloyd, is that is you're being honest, at least you know, being straightforward and candid. That look, you're you're not saying directly, this is God or that or this or whatever your experience said. Um, you're just sharing what's happened to you, mm. and uh, and like I said, I've talked to many people. I've had friends who've been on drugs before and. They, you know, I'll, I'll make a joke, but it wasn't really. That. I saw Elvis, but you know, what I mean, like they they say they see things, and yeah, you know, it's like the Bruce Willis movie. You know, I see dead people, and um, but in all seriousness, so what what I've gotten from this conversation today, we can wrap up, and I'd love to have a part two somewhere down the road, Lloyd. Yeah, um, it sounds to me in your experience of you know being raised as a witness, and as you talked about being forced as the organization will do on people and then at some point you saw issues and then you start pursuing that pursuit of truth eventually that led you out and then in your journey still pursuing truth you're where you're at currently atheist slash agnostic where you're at um but going back to your daughter you know jessica liberty right that word liberty through where you're at now, you have the liberty to choose to believe or not to believe. You have the choice to accept this is fact or that's not fact or this is historical or that's not historical. And in this experience recently that let's say six months or a year ago, you probably might not be talking like you are today, right? So I look at that as a positive, whether it was hallucination or not, that I had an opportunity to talk with you and be able to share some of my faith with you as well. And I appreciate yeah. that. And I would love to have more chats down the road with you on your journey. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. the worst that could happen? <laughs> well, no, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either I become an atheist or you become a Christian. And, uh, yeah. you know, there we go. Who we'll, knows? Who, who knows? knows? But, yeah. You know, we're on a journey together, and I'm hoping I have many more years in this life. And, um, you know, if, if, and I throw this out there because I didn't bring you on this directly for us, but I, I'm always open to talking to people like yourself that have honest questions, honest, mm. honest questions. Um, I'm not a phony. I hope that you got that from me today. Yeah. Um, talking more directly. And um, I'm up front too. If someone asks me a question that I don't have an answer to, I'll be like, mm. you know, that's a really good question. I just don't have an answer for that. Yeah. I think what happens so often is so often with people of different religions, religions and faiths, is people try to make up answers to try to plug in that hole of something they don't have. And I'm like, you know what? If I don't have an answer, I'll just be frank. I don't have an answer. and um, But I still want to be in the pursuit of truth. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, my, my whole thing uh, or the angle that I'm approaching any conversation with a believer from is that I'm, I really don't have a, anything to save you to. You know, so I, I don't lose any sleep if I have a conversation with a believer in any religion or or cult or whatever. Yeah. Um. And and they they say, you know, I, I take what you're saying on board, Lloyd, but, you know, I, I'm going to continue with my it doesn't bother me in the slightest. Right. Um. So I, I don't have any desire to change people's minds. Obviously, on my channel, I'm gonna share what I what I know and share my truth and share my opinions. Sure. Um, because it's actually a, a quote from Christopher Hitchens. He said, um, 
the grave will supply plenty of time for silence. Hmm. And that's kind of been my my life's motto. You know, once you're dead, your chances of of saying anything is gone. So while hmm. while you have breath in your lungs, um even if even if people are gonna hate you for what you're you're saying and despise you um and try to ruin you, don't let them bully you into silence because you know, there's plenty of time for silence once you're dead. <laughs> so uh, as long as I get to share what I know on my channel, um, I, you know, e even then when people come on my channel and when people watch my channel, sorry, I'm not, uh, and I, I make this clear to my audience, I'm not insisting that people share my beliefs. Um, I think it would be really, really boring if I was surrounded by people who, who see the world the way I see it and had just a carbon copy of my my thoughts and opinions it, it would be a boring no, I think world. it'd be a great world if there was many of me out there so there you go no, I'm just joking <laughs> maybe just a few more yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if at I least, could just at least tweak all, the maybe, dial a little bit I had a few of me that we, at least I, at least we get each other right like right Kelly right Kelly yeah yeah like, yeah I'm talking to you I'm just joking. I'd maybe mess with the dial a little bit but yeah. um no I wouldn't want everybody to no. to share my opinion it just and that's boring. what makes us unique right like mm. I, I think diversity and, and personality i mean it is neat when you have someone who's like-minded too sometimes but still some differences of course yeah you know i like what you said I'll, I'll i'll quote a famous guy too um jesus said the truth will set, shall set you free right and so did. i like i like that one so yeah as our pursuit of truth you know we, we always want to be open to truth and um and Jesus even said he was the truth, right? And so he's either he's either true or he's false on one of those statements, right? I and want so, to I want to quote a scripture too. Um, now look at this, folks. An atheist is going to quote a scripture on my channel. I love this, and I'm being silly with that, Lloyd. Being fun with that. Don't take it the wrong way. Sorry, bear with me. Um, oh, there we are. It's the one. Um, it's the one where Paul says, "Whatever things are true, whatever things uh, are advantageous." Philippians, Philippians chapter four, verse eight and nine. Can you read it? I can. Give me one second. Give me one second. Philippians four. All right. The quote is: He says, "Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right." Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Perfect, uh, perfect, beautiful words. I could, I, I can't dis, I can't disagree with anything, anything there. I, and who would? Yeah, you no, know? it's good. Mm. It's a good, it's a good thought. Well, Lloyd, I, I value your time, um, and look forward to us having another conversation and if you'd like to maybe bring me on your channel i'd be totally open or you can come back over here i'll give you that opportunity perfect oh, well as long as we get to chat again that sounds perfect for me uh, I, I look forward to it but thank you for having me on the show i've really enjoyed having this conversation and i look forward to many more all right lloyd have a good rest of your day i appreciate you coming on cheers all right talk to you later Bye. all right friends Thank you so much for uh, joining today. This was Lloyd hanging out with us and uh, really appreciate him taking the time to be here. So my encouragement to anyone listening to this is when you leave comments later, be respectful in your comments on this conversation, right? This is, again, with a conversation between two people just getting to know each other on this journey for truth. So thank you for being here. Lord bless you. And as always, I always leave in my videos, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.